Zach Karanovich. I'm the graduate research assistant at the Boise Center, and I'm here just for a couple of quick announcements. First, uh, we're recording, so I would ask that you please turn off your uh, noise-making machines, phones, pagers, beepers, etc. Secondly, uh, you'll see on the scrolling screen we have a couple of upcoming uh, very interesting luncheon colloquia that we host at the Boise Center. So for more information on these and all of our events, we encourage you to visit our website, bc.edu slash boise, or follow us on social media. And without further ado, to introduce our featured speaker, I'm going to introduce you to our executive director, Mark Massa. Massimo Fagioli is a very smart guy. <laughs> he, is, he is a very smart guy, actually. He, Massimo uh, is currently professor of theology at Villanova University, Philadelphia. He was the founding director of the Institute for Catholicism and Citizenship at St. Thomas University in St. Paul, Minnesota. He is the author of 17 books. I have to like lay down every time I say that. He is the author of 17 books, uh, both because he is smart and because he never sleeps. Among those books are Vatican II, The Battle for Meaning, Sorting Out Catholicism, A History of New Ecclesial Movements, Pope Francis's, Pope Francis, excuse me, tra Tradition in Transition. And Joe, most recently, Joe Biden and Catholicism in the United States. He has won the Catholic Media Association Award for his book, The Liminal Papacy of Pope Francis, and the Catholic Press Association Award for Catholicism and Citizenship. He has also won the Eve Congar Award for Theological Excellence and the Catholic Library Associations of Jerome Award. He is as well a very good friend of mine, so I, I will always that. It gives both me and the Blasi Center a great pleasure and honor to welcome Massimo, a true scholarly star, to Boston College to deliver our 20th Prophetic Voices Lecture. Massimo, welcome. Good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be back in Boston uh, with great friends and colleagues in the most important school of theology in the United States for sure and one of the most important in the world. I arrived in the United States 15 years ago and my landing spot was Boston at the Jesuit Institute at Boston College. I was coming from Ferrara, the city where Girolamo Savonarola ascetic Italian Dominican friar and preacher active in Renaissance Florence was born. Charismatic in vigorously proclaiming from the pulpits the religious and political principles to which he managed to conform for a short time the Florentine Republic, he ended up hanged and burned at a stake in Piazza della Signoria. It was his appeal to a new council that sealed his fate which was part of an unwritten agreement between the papacy and the Medici dynasty. Writing a few years after he was burned in 1498, and not far from the place where that execution took place, the political philosopher and scientist Niccolò Machiavelli spoke critically of Savonarola in many ways, and in chapter six of his masterpiece, The Prince, Machiavelli called Savonarola somehow derisively, quote, an unarmed prophet. <laughs> For Machiavelli, a prophet must arm or weaponize his, his ideas and make it a state. And so this presence of Savonarola, the unarmed prophet from my hometown Ferrara, came to my mind when I was asked to talk about prophecy and synodality. Because our problem is, in the Catholic Church of today, that we have to think of the role of the prophets and of, uh, and of prophecy in a church where the traditional forms and structures of power are in a state of perilous instability and on the verge of collapse. Where there 
are temptations to, to resort to Savonarolian measures, sackcloth and ashes, to fight against corruption and abuses in the church. The voice of the episcopate, the backbone of the institutional church, finds itself in a moral and epistemological wilderness in this situation, while other less visible forms and structures of power are silently taking over. And so the Catholic Church today needs new ways to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, a proclamation that will have to be made more by the people of God and less by the clerical elites. And so this church is trying to find those new ways. And to do this, the church needs a new form and therefore also to look again at, at prophecy. So what I, I, I will do today is first to look at prophecy, apostolicity, and synodality from Vatican II to today. Second, to see how the most important ecclesiologist at Vatican II, Yves Congar, saw the relationship between prophecy and apostolicity in church government. Third, I will look at the yawning gap between prophecy and institution in a current ecclesial crisis. And in conclusion, I will propose some personal insights into prophecy from an ecclesiological point of view. First, in the corpus of the Second Vatican Council, we do not find the word synodality, but the concept is there in Nuce and in the Mens, in the intention of the Council Fathers. More explicit is the understanding of prophecy when in which in turn helps us understand where and how the synodal idea is in Vatican II. For example, Lumen Gentium 12, quote, the holy people of God has a share to also in the prophetic role of Christ. Lumen Gentium 31, quote, be faithful sharers in, in Christ's priestly, prophetic, and royal office, end quote, Lumen Gentium 35, with that mention of the census fide, <clears throat> but also in the decree on the uh, uh, apostolate of the laity apostolic amoxitatem. Number two, lay people sharing in the priestly, prophetic, and kingly offices of Christ play their part in the mission of the whole people of God in the church and in the world. End quote. And also in Agentes 15. Now, what's important to see here, I think, is the strong link between prophecy and apostolicity in Vatican II. In De Verbum 17, quote, this is a mystery which was not made known to other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets through the Holy Spirit, end quote, De Verbum 17, but also Agentes 9, quote, by missionary activity, the mystical body is increased to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ at the spiritual temple where God is adored in spirit and truth grows and is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. End quote. And so Vatican II, on the one side, elevates and solidifies the role of the episcopate in the church, throughout the council, and not just in church governance, but also for what concerns the legitimization and, and ecclesi ecclesi ecclesialization of prophecy, especially in Lumen Gentium and in De Verbo. On the other side, while strengthening the role of the bishops also in terms of the transmission of the tradition and of teaching, Vatican II opens to a different ecclesial form when, when it comes to the subjects of teaching. Strictly speaking, as Episcopal collegiality in a rebalancing of Vatican I, in Human Genesis chapter 3, and more intuitively hinting at a larger concept of collegiality as participation of the whole people of God, like in Human Genesis 12. Now, what followed in the, in the, in the in the first 50 or 60 years after Vatican II, until the election of Pope Francis, was an effort from the institutional church to contain 
the trajectory of the conciliar teaching within the boundaries of Episcopal collegiality, according especially to Lumen Gentium chapter 3, and to keep the control of the prophetic within the, the apostolic, with the apostolic being firmly regulated by the universal level and in Tridentine forms of church governments. And this dynamic is still visible although in significantly different ways compared to the pre-Francis doctrinal policies, if one looks, for example, in these last few weeks, at appointed exchanges between the German Bishop Conference and the Vatican, the letters of the last few days of January. And so there are two aspects uh, here. From the point of view of the institutional development of, of the post-Vatican II Church, we could look for example, at the history of the underdevelopment of synodality, both at the, at the central level, the ways in which the bishop's synod were celebrated until 2014, and at the local level, with the disappearance of local synod and plenary councils and the strong limitations imposed on the authority of the bishop conferences. But from the point of view of the doctrinal policy, of the Vatican. One example is the 1990 instruction on the ecclesial vocation of the theologian, Donum Veritatis, issued by the doctrine of the faith, which sought to clarify the role of the theologian in the life of the church without ever being encouraged to draw insight from the witness of God's people and without acknowledging that the ecclesiality of the theological vocation included a necessary prophetic dimension. It's something on which Richard Gallardi and Catherine Clifford wrote very, uh, very eloquently in 2014. And so, but also, for example, Benedict the 16th exhortation of 2010, the verbum domini reserved a similar submissive and extra ecclesial role to the prophetic activity of the lay people, for example, paragraph 94. So this is where Pope Francis and the synodal process that is now unfolding pick up the thread coming from Vatican II as it has been received by John Paul II and Benedict XVI. He, in his Magna Carta speech on synodality of October 17, 2015, Francis mentioned the prophetic function as a balancing act between the Episcopate and the people, quote, the synodal journey begins by listening to the people who also participate in, in the prophetic function of Christ according to a principle dear to the church of the first millennium, quod omnes tangit ab omnibus tractari debe. The journey of the synod continues by listening to the pastors and through the Synod Fathers, the bishops act as authentic guardians, interpreters, and witnesses of the faith of the whole church, which they must be able to carefully distinguish from the often changing flows of public opinion." End quote. In this and in other passages by Francis on synodality, I think, are evident the Congarian roots of his ecclesiology. And so this is visible, especially in the emphasis that he has put here and in other speeches on that ancient principle of Roman law, which was enshrined in the canonical tradition of migration uh, in, in, uh, in uh, the Decretum, quod omnes tangit ab omnibus tractari debet, what touches all must be approved by all. It is therefore important, I think, to, uh, to understand the import of Congar's ecclesiology in the foundations of the teaching of the Second Vatican Council on the relations between the episcopacy and the lady, and to see how these limits are also limits, I think, of Pope Francis. Congar dedicated much of his life and work to ecclesiology, and in particular to the ecclesiology of the episcopate and of the lady even before Vatican II, with groundbreaking studies since the early 1950s. In an essay published in the journal Irenicon in 1951, Congar analyzed the relationship between prophetic function 
and lay people. In, in, in the three offices of Christ as prophet, as priest, and king, Congar framed prophecy as belonging to teaching. But prophecy is bigger than that because it includes also, he, he, he emphasized, mystical knowledge. Congar specified that all baptized are prophets, but only some have magisterium. The way in, in, in which he sees the economy of mission and of communication from God is in a way that is not dispersed, not anarchic, inorganic, but in a spiritual community which, with organizational principles in the constitution of the church, and, and, and there's a quotation here, all the faithful are enlightened and active but within the knowledge received from the words of the apostles and regulated by the apostolic authority. It's not a revelation, not an independent and direct knowledge. It represents a personal and living intelligence of the revelation given to the apostles and received by them." End quote. On the other hand, in the distinction between Ecclesia docens, the, the teaching church, and Ecclesia editions, the learning church, Congar con was concerned to show their organic unity, which is a unity between the, the church as a sacramentum, as a communication of grace, and the church as a res, as a thing, as a real lived community. But Congar did set limits for the role of a deity. Quote, the collaboration of the faithful to the teaching ministry of the church is not on the plan of the powers that structure the church or of the acts that condition the validity of the actions of the hierarchy. The collaboration of the faithful is at the level of the life of the church and of the concrete form of exercise of apostolic powers. And so according to Congar, the role of the prophets is always subordinate, like the apostolate, to apostolicity, one of the, of the fundamental and essential structures of the church. Congar addressed this issue also in his most important book, True and False Reform in the Church, which had a second edition in 1968 where there was a section specifically titled Prophets and Reformers. In a descriptive way, he put in a few words, in a very Congarian way, quote, the governance of the church is no longer prophetic, but apostolic, end quote. But in, in a prescriptive way, Congar stated, quote, that the only valid prophecy in the church is in, the is in the service of the church's apostolicity, end quote. And he emphasized the perils of prophetic activity, such as professionalism and intoxication. So here Congar stressed the difference between prophets in communion with this, the church versus the independent kind of scholar where communion with the church is not understood as something servile or, or, or mechanical, but in the famous Latin uh, term, sentire cum ecclesi. In his assessment of the role of the prophecy in the church with this exquisite historical sensibility, Congar noted the phenomenon of the great development of Roman teaching in the 19th century, which he wanted to rebalance in the 20th century with bishops' teaching and contribution from lay people. He saw that the lay people's contribution, uh, quote, as a function preparatory and complementary to the one of the hierarchy, end quote. So here Congar warned clearly against a certain naivete towards the sensus fidelium, quote, the believing and loving church, that is the body of the faithful, is infallible in the living possession of the faith. It's not infallible in one particular act or judgment, end quote. 
Even more sharply, Congar uh, wrote, quote, we cannot say that the faithful people does not teach. It teaches, and very actively, but not with the, the same capacity of apostolic authority, that is by imperative judgment. The people teach in its capacity of believers of an interior faith through all the activities of life and thought which it fosters and nourishes." And, 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 and quote. So now, after 70 years from what Congar wrote, oh, so there was certainly a post-Vatican II evolution in Congar's ecclesiology, a theology of, uh, uh, of uh, the lay people in a more spirit-orientated view of, uh, the, of the church, but always in an ecclesial vision that is both hierarchical and collegial of ecclesial leaders and colleges of ministers of the community. And at the same time, we must remember that Congar never developed a theology of the institutions of synodality, which is where we are today in our church. So this is where we find ourselves today with the synodal process, with the problem of how representative, for, for, for example, an assembly of bishops and of superiors of male religious orders would be for the church of today in a future council. The prerequisite for a, a consider event or an ecclesial event with council-like consequences are here, where what has happened up to now in the, in the councils precedes it. But this normal process of 21-24, now underway, is taking place according to a completely different preparation compared to the one that took place between 1959 and 1962 to prepare Vatican II. This process is much more decentralized and involves the whole people of God, those who could and desire and still desire to participate. So what are we supposed to make of Congar's ecclesiology today? I think that in the context of the ongoing civil process, the relationship between prophecy and church government, as identified with the episcopate, is one of the eminent cases that show both the legacy and the limits of Vatican II. This has to do with the change of scene compared to the time of, of the Second Vatican Council, obvious after 60 years, but it has to do also with an ecclesial crisis in which the abuse crisis has become the flashpoint for a more general instability and, I believe, unsustainability of the previously established Catholic form or order. In many parts of the church uh, today, and in the West in a particular way, we see the, the collapse of, 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 of church authority, but also of the legitimacy of the church, and in particular of the episcopate. The abuse crisis has amplified the gap between prophecy and apostolicity in the Catholic Church with the issues that it has raised in terms of accountability, of representation, but even more fundamentally, of coherence with the gospel of Jesus Christ. What Congar wrote in 1951, quote, the governance of the church is no longer prophetic, but apostolic, sounds much more problematic today, if not tragic. Vatican II and the institutional implementation of Vatican II in the years after have solidified a silencing of the prophetic in favor of the uh, apostolic in the sense of the bishops, in something like a return to 18th century Episcopalism, but now much tame and reconciled with papal power, but often disconnected with the local churches. The isolation of the Episcopate is evident, not only with the respect of the laity or the public opinion, but also with their own diocesan clergy, as was recently highlighted by a study carried out by the, uh, the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. a few months ago. 
In the Catholic Church, and in this country in particular, I think, we have seen in the last few years, especially the unsustainability of this kind of Episcopalism, and what this empty Episcopalism has produced, as side effects, a very short list. The displacement of ecclesial discourse to the sphere of journalism, even by bishops and church leaders themselves, sometimes adopting a normalizing style and ethics of, of communication that are not always ecclesial in this way. The proliferation of court prophets in the halls of political and financial power, what I would call parasitic prophetism, as opposed to a prophetism that is modeled after scripture. The rise of professional Catholic influencers, thanks to the the democratization of voices offered by the internet, whose reach far outpaces what almost any layperson, journalist, or theologian could expect to have working for the church, making content for monetized ads clicks. The more controversy, the better. The utopian nature of the prophetic discourse with its radicalism that is often corrosive of communal bonds with, as Katie Cavani wrote in her book of a few years ago, A Prophecy Without Contempt, quote, its emphatic and unequivocal condemnation conjoined with its vivid language have a disproportionate effect on the way the communication in which it is embedded is received, end quote. The politicization of prophecy, though, so that its truth is measurable only from its success or failure at the political level, but also in the intra-ecclesial disputes. And finally, a phenomenon of Catholic ex exculturation, where the emphasis on the countercultural nature of the church teaching on the hot-button issues often serves as an illusory self-validation of the prophetic character of its discourse. Now, synodality could be the response to some of these crises, and in particular to the limits of Vatican II Episcopalism and to some of these distortions of the prophetic element in the Catholic Church. The ongoing synodal process is tempting some church leaders, to be very honest, to double down on, on Episcopalism. And at the same time, the ongoing debate on synodality and the synodal process should not be, in my opinion, completely disconnected from a healthy and pragmatic sense of the church and of church history. As my former colleague in the Twin Cities and church historian Michael Hollerick wrote in, in, in the conclusions of his recent book on Eusebius of, of Caesarea, he wrote this quote, it is difficult for this writer at least to imagine historic Christianity without some versions of apostolicity as guarantor of continuity across time and some claim of Catholicity across space. And for that continuity to be linked in some way with church structure, whether we think it originated in Jewish synagogal practice or in Greek municipal assemblies, household governance, or a combination of all three. A purely charismatic Christianity never existed." End quote. Now, what are the challenges for, for prophecy and synodality at this moment, in my opinion? I think that this process shows its potential if we look at the context of the history of the relationship between prophecy and the institutional church, and in an institutional church, that is still structured largely along the foundations laid by European Christendom in the second millennium. As Italian church historian Paolo Prodi argued a few years ago, in the transition between the Middle Ages and the Modern Age, prophecy disappears, it is replaced in secular modernity by utopia, and in the church by an historical mill millennialism, by mysticism, and by models of holiness that do not address the problem of human history as a history of salvation. 
So now singularity is redesigning some important features of our common home. Also because this is, I, I, I believe it's very important, also because this, this process, this synodal process, coincides chronologically and is part of a historical turn towards a de-Europeanization of Catholicism. De-globalization of Catholicism, or to use Rainer's term, the World Church has the potential to redefine the seizure of the prophecy by an institution that took place in medieval and early modern Catholicism. This could be, to quote Michel de Certeau, a new prise de la parole. So this is a key moment in Francis Pontificate, but more broadly in the history of the post-Vatican II Church. And so there are many unknowns. The legacy and limits of Congar's view are the limits also of the Second Vatican Council, largely. And they might be also, also part of Francis' legacy and limits. But as we all know, Pope Francis' pontificate is a pontificate of surprises. Anyway, it's useful to have a sense of, of, of a few issues that I think are on the table. First, synodality challenges all members of the church to redefine not only the settings and the volume of the ecclesial conversation, but also the parameters of that conversation. In an evangelizing church, the prophetic voice must rethink its dialectics vis-a-vis -vis the institutional or apostolic voice. The question is whether and how being a discerning church entails an overcoming of the distinction or separation between the ecclesia docens, the, the, the teaching church, and the ecclesia visions, learning church. The important po uh, point here, and I say this as a scholar of the Second Vatican Council, synodality cannot be reduced to another wave of institutional interpretations of the Second Vatican Council, and, and another diatribe on the hermeneutics. The issue of synodality and the institutional forms it takes in the church I think depends on the, uh, on the ability to implement in the church of today a transition from a theology that's based on church teaching or a theology of church teaching to a theology of revelation. Second, there is no future for the church without more action by lay people. This means also a recognition of the prophetic voice of the lay people in ways that are institutionally more hospitable and visible. This requires a new style of conversation in the, in the church, but also a, a new style of hospitality, which opened the doors, enlarged the, the tent, also to those lay prophets that have not been listened to at home in the Catholic Church. So here synodality has no future without a prophetic voice that has been excluded so far. But it has no future either without the, the voice of the bishops. Catholics now largely experience a separation and alienation between the apostolic function and the rest of the church. It's impossible, I think, to, to imagine a synodal church, not just for canon law's sake, but also theologically, a synodal church without the voice of, of the, uh, 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 the episcopate, or worse, a church in which the voice of the episcopate is commonly seen as the opposite of prophecy, or against prophecy, or prone to aspiring to be court prophets. Third, on ministeriality. A key question concerns the relationship of prophecy with ministry in the church. That is, if a more prophetic church can move beyond ministeriality that is, uh, it is identified almost exclusively with male ordained ministry towards a plurality of ministerial roles. But how to do that? Is the alternative an almost completely post-ministerial Catholicism? 
model on a Catholic laity as the main subject of the experience of the communities whose pastoral practices are characterized by the inclusion of the personal or professional skills brought by special members of the community. I think this would be a model that could be hardly universalized and carries significant risks of what I, I, I would call uh, a gentrification of prophecy. Fourth, when we talk about synodality and prophecy in the church of today, we cannot ignore the discussion on the role of women in the church, still often seen as guests in their own house. Probably the biggest test of synodality is the recognition and listening of the prophetic voice of women within the visible institutional church. And to be even more blunt, we will not have a synodal church as long as we measure the role of women in the church by looking exclusively at the number of appointments in administrative positions such as Roman Curia officials, chancellors, or judges. As important as these appointments are, it's about their public voice in the church. Also, as we all know, in the context of the, of the, the, the the abuse crisis, the absence of women in ecclesial leadership roles means that often abuses against them continue to be seen as nothing more than an unpleasant but minor inconvenience. The role of theology. Theology is a public war that can choose to be or not to be prophetic, and the apostolic monus can choose or refuse to accept the voice of theology in in its prophetic modus and in its, in its potential to overcome the dichotomy between ecclesia doctrines and ecclesia visions. As Ghislaine Lafont put it more than 20 years ago, our theology is marked by the primacy of knowledge or wisdom that's knowledge over prophecy. Our times need a theology that as a prophetic structure and pool in French, she called it allure, an understanding of the faith coming from a listening to our world and its aspirations at the same time from a meditation on the biblical and liturgical space of the covenant. Again, in theology, the voice of female theologians is, is critical, but still largely absent today. Sixth, the prophecy and the charismatic element. The last few years in the history of the abuse crisis, with the revelations on serial abusers among the charismatic leaders and even founders of new communities and movements, are a powerful reminder of the dangers of seeking popularity at home for this new kind of profit. In, in the foundations of these new movements, in, in the second part of the 20th century, Serious crimes have been committed in the name of the founder's prophetic charisma. The halo that surrounded the, the charisma justified the absence of control and supervision by the institutional church. Often the mark of authenticity of these new prophets was seen in their distance from the institutional church and from the bishops. And at the same time, these prophets actively sought and obtained recognition from the institutional church, sometimes hailed as the creative communities that were supposed to save the church from inertia. The very label of prophets has been damaged by these stories of sexual and spiritual perversion, which were hidden under the cover of attractive elements for an institutional church in a sociological and cultural crisis. Apostolic dynamism, moral rigorism, and entrepreneurial community building. Now, a few words of conclusion here. It is true that prophets are never honored at home. And this is also an ever valid warning against the facile elevation and celebration of prophets. The fact that the bishops or theologians also are, are not honored in their own home, in their own church, is no guarantee of the prophetic nature of their work. 
Synodality challenges the self-validation of the institutional church's counterculturalism as prophetic on the thin and slippery basis of unpopularity, an ever-present risk in the church that even during synodality emphasizes its suspicion of democracy. People can become deaf to the prophetic voice of the bishops because the bishop's voice has been silent or inaudible. Deaf masses are sometimes born of voiceless guides. Unpopularity as a sole marker of the prophetic is particularly dangerous when eminent voices in the Catholic Church tend to react against the challenges of secularization with an apologetics on enmity. And this is typical of those who embrace a particular option that are very different from that monastic flight from the world that had marked past centuries. Contrary to the Benedict option, for example, that monastic flight did not make claims on the world, while the modern enmity towards the world is all aimed at regaining a place in the world for the church and in the position of privilege. But I think that the most tragic sign of the serious situation in which the church finds itself is that we Catholics, we are often seen as members of, of, of a church portraying a God as an enemy of men and women of today, as an obstacle to their aspiration to freedom and dignity. It's hard not to see that representation of, of, of Catholicism as the enemy how it has become part of the perception of our church today and for serious reasons. Non-Christian traditions are, are viewed often, sometimes even by Catholics, as more Jesus-like or, or more prophetic than the church. This is such a tragic contrast from the beginning of the Conciliar Constitution on Revelation, De Verbum, number two, quote, God, who is invisible, in his great love, speaks to humankind as friends and enters into their life so as to invite and receive them into relationship. A second question central to relationship between prophecy and solidarity today is the chance to reorient the church to an, an evangelization that is not measurable in terms of political victory or legislative consensus, but open to the gospel-like paradoxical and tragic dimension of the church walking towards the kingdom. This requires an understanding of the prophetic element in the church and of the church that escapes the temptation to seek refuge in the Schmittian paradigm of the political as, as distinction between friend and enemy, which is nothing else but a new form of alliance between throne and altar. But this Schmittian paradigm tends also to shape, in our ecclesial imagination, a binary and exclusionary opposition between the prophetic and the institutional. Social and political concerns have shaped contemporary theology to the point that every field of theology has become virtually, in one way or another, political theology. Militant political theologies with prophetic aspirations that are sometimes dismissive of the paradoxical risk mutating into a political ecclesiology that runs the risk sometimes to carry sectarian and therefore non-Catholic traits. The emphasis on prophecy and on the prophetical takes place often at the expense of the paradoxical, which, when it is given its due, legitimate, sacred space by the institutional church, is able to enlarge the tent of the church. This is why the ecclesiological focus on the civil process, I think it's very important to look at this from how the prophetic can interact with the view of the civil church. Thank you very much.